Welcome to Bangalore Revival Center. Here we dream revival and serve people with love. Today, Pastor Priji concludes the Gospel According to Paul series with the book of Romans 12 on the rational way of living a Christian life. Do listen and be encouraged. We are in the book of Romans chapter 12. Let's read verse 1. This is a very familiar portion of scripture, so I'm not going to take a lot of time trying to get you to understand this. But it says, and so dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all that he has done for you. Let them be a living and a holy sacrifice. The kind that he will find acceptable. Because this is truly the way to worship him. The way to worship him is through sacrifice. The way to worship him is through an offering that hurts. Is through giving him something that is going to cost us something. Is by giving him something that is going to cause us to lay ourselves down on the altar to the even to the point of death it says i request you i plead with you i beseech you my dear friends my dear brothers what do i beseech you i beseech you to give your bodies you know it's very easy to give our hearts it's very easy to give our minds not always but it's easy to give because no one else can you know put a finger on it and judge that part of your life but it is harder to give our bodies you know jesus looked at the disciples and said i see i know that your spirit is willing but your flesh it is weak in your flesh i know you you have your weakness but that is what i want from you i don't want your spirit you don't have a spirit apart from what i have already given you the spirit that you have that is my spirit I gave you that spirit. But what I want from you is your bodies. I want you to give your bodies as a living sacrifice. As a living sacrifice, a kind on which his fire can come upon. Fire doesn't come upon just mediocre worship. Fire comes upon sacrificial worship. Yeah. You would hear about how Elijah he would work an entire day to build the altar to build the sacrifice before he can call for the fire to come down we jump to the fire part without working on the off- offering without working on the sacrifices without working on our altars without building up our lives in such a way that it is an acceptable offering an acceptable worship for god This morning the Lord is inviting our church to a place where we sacrifice we lay down every comfort in our physical realm every convenience everything that is holding us back from giving ourselves 100% to God the Lord is calling us to give it to him to lay it down to let it be a sacrifice to let it be a a living sacrifice okay what does it say I plead with you I I request you church this is not something that Paul is commanding the church but he is requesting he is telling him hey this this is what is going to please God this is what is going to bring pleasure to God this is what is going to bring joy to the heart of God it is that you will lay down your bodies you will give your bodies as a living sacrifice so this season the season ahead the Lord is inviting us to uh, do something sacrificial with our bodies to do something out of the ordinary in 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 killing our flesh okay we will do that on a personal level we will do that together as a family and we will do that as a church in your in your personal life there are sacrifices that you have to make uh, now i'm not just talking about uh, things that are wrong or things that are bad you know they are not even allowed into the uh, you know in, in the old testament when when they had to offer something when they had to sacrifice something they would make sure that the sacrifice will not be a a a broken sacrifice 
In other words, let's say that the lamb that they are bringing is, is blind in one eye or has one broken limb. They will not even consider that for sacrifice. Or if it has any spots or any speckles, they, they, they will not consider it for sacrifice. So, they, so I'm not talking about sinlessness. We, we, are, we are way past beyond that stage. We, I'm not talking about how you need to give up on any sinful habits or anything that doesn't bring honor and glory to God. That's, that's, that's the beginning point at which we put our faith in Jesus because we confess, we, we receive Jesus as our Lord and we disconnect from our old life. And, and if there is anything like that, yes, you need to make sure that that is left way behind, you know, the altar. But even the good parts of you, even the parts that you feel are, you know, good. Even the parts that you know you, you, you want to serve God with. Your abilities, your talents, your, uh, your, your finances, whatever it may be. Your, 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 the best parts of your life. The Lord is inviting you to even give that up. To lay that down on the altar. That is where the Lord is inviting us. The Lord is saying, will you... Will you give your bodies to, and, and bring it down and, and lay it as a living sacrifice? A sacrifice that is constantly active. A sacrifice that is active from Monday to Saturday. Will you bring your bodies into that place? Will you train yourself? Will you train your uh, uh, routines, your daily uh, schedules, everything to bring yourself to a place where you are giving yourself 100% to Jesus. Because the Lord says, I want, to, I want to fall on some sacrifices. I want to release a fire that will fill sacrifices. It says, the other translations would say, uh, dear brothers and sisters, I ask you by the mercies of God, by the mercies of God, NLT would say, because of all that God has done for you, because of what God has uh, already predestined, already chosen, selected, uh, uh, you know, we, we read all those aspects, he, how he justified us, how he uh, glorified us, how he made sure that you and I, we will not be on our own. It's because of the mercies of God that we are here so far. Now, a lot of Christians, they stop with reading till Romans chapter 8. And they, they go back home satisfied and happy saying, okay, we are not saved by works, we are saved by grace. So great, so praise God, so we, works are not important. No, Paul says, hey, yes, we are saved by grace. Yes, we are here because of the mercy of God. Yes, we are here because God chose us. But now that requires us to respond to that mercy of God. He's saying because of the mercy of God, because of what he has done for us, now he is expecting something in return. He is expecting your entirety, your whole life, your, your whole body, everything in the physical realm. You know, things that are out of your control, God is not going to ask you to give. But... Whatever is in your control, the Lord is saying, I, I want that as a sacrifice. I want as hurting as it may be, as challenging as it may be, I want the fullness, the whole of you, completely, a hundred percent, I want it. In fact, it says, let them be a living and a holy sacrifice, the kind that he will find acceptable, because this is truly the way to worship him. The other translations would use the word, this is a reasonable way of worshipping him. Or this is the, the rational way of worshipping. This is the, 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 the logical way of worshipping him. You know that this gospel that we are talking about, it's a, it's a rational gospel. God is not irrational. When God gives, uh, you know, it, it is a transaction where he also expects something from us. God's love, it is unconditional because he also loves Lucifer. God's love is unconditional. But God's selection, his mercy, his grace, that is not unconditional. Because when he gives us his mercy, he expects us to respond to that mercy of God. 
And Paul says this is rational, this is true, this is the right way to worship God. The Amplified Bible says this is the intelligent way of worshiping God. When you respond to God because of what he has done for us by giving your whole body, your entire life. Let me just read it from the Amplified Bible. If you can just pull it up, I'll read the whole verse from the Amplified Bible. It says, therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God to present your bodies, dedicating all of yourselves set apart as a living sacrifice that is holy and well-pleasing to God. Why? Because this is your rational, your logical, your intelligent act of worship. This is intelligent. This is, this is rational. This is logical. This gospel, it expects something in, in return. When, when you understand who God is and you can walk out of that place without uh, doing anything about it, I don't think you really understood what God is. It cannot be that you had a revelation of the mercy of God and you went out and your life is not transformed, your life is not changed. It cannot be that you just had a meal with Jesus. You know that so many people had meals with Jesus? Yeah. But Zacchaeus, he came out transformed. Everybody else who had dinner with Jesus, they were the same before and after the dinner. But here is a Zacchaeus, he began to bring a lifestyle change. He said, no, 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 I, I cannot have this much money in my account anymore. What did he do? Half his wealth he gave to the poor. And the ones that, am I right? In, in like, come on, anybody who remember the accounts here? Yeah? Half his wealth he gave to the poor. And whoever he had cheated, he gave them back four times more. What did Jesus do? All that Jesus did is give him something that he didn't deserve. Jesus gave him an encounter. Jesus gave him an experience, a dinner, one meal with Jesus. And there are other Pharisees who had meals with Jesus and that did nothing to them. You remember the point where Mary came and washed the feet of Jesus. That, that was in the house of one of the Pharisees and it didn't change them. It didn't transform them. They, they, there was no lifestyle changes. The, the encounter they received, the mercies they received, the grace that they received did not create any change in their life. So I, I have a problem with that kind of a Christianity. When we can come to God day after day, week after week, experience God, encounter God, but that doesn't change our lives. Paul says, guys, this is, this is reasonable. This is acceptable, this is intelligent, this is rational. On the other hand, when you, when, you don't, when, when you don't respond to the mercy of God, when you don't respond to the grace of God, when you don't respond to the, the favor of God upon your life, that is unintelligent. That is a lack of logic there. That is not rational, that is not sensible, that is not acceptable, that is not true. The, the right way of responding to God is saying, okay, God, you gave your full to me. You gave yourself a hundred percent to me. Now I'm going to give myself a hundred percent. I'm not going to hold back anything. I'm not going to draw any boundaries. I'm not going to say this far and no more. I'm going to give my everything to you. Let's read it one more time. It says, so dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to do what? To give your bodies to God because of all that He has done for you. Let them be a living and a holy sacrifice, the kind that He will find acceptable. Why? This is the true, the, the right way, the, the acceptable way, the, the intelligent way to worship Him. What you do here on Sunday mornings for one hour or what you do at your homes uh, when the music is playing, that is not worship. That's not worship. That is praise. That is you expressing your thanksgiving to God. That is you expressing your love for the Lord with your words, with your actions. You're, you're expressing how much you're grateful to God. That is not worship. Worship is what you do with your bodies from Monday to Saturday. Worship is how you posture your life. 
Worship is how you, you have conversations with the people around you. Worship is how you, you have relationships. Worship is how you manage your finances. Worship is how you realign your life, re, uh, you know, remold your life to adjust with the lifestyle, with the encounter that you've just had with Jesus. You know, Jesus, you would never find Jesus telling Zacchaeus, I want you to go and give half your wealth to the poor or but there there was an opening up of his intelligence when he had that encounter with Jesus. That automatically he said, I I don't need somebody to come and tell me what to do now. I don't need somebody to tell me that I I cannot be in a living relationship. I don't need somebody to tell me that I I cannot, you know, you know, do continue to uh, be in, in all of these substance abuse. I don't need somebody to now come and push me out of these things. I just know my intelligence has opened up. I know what is the right way to respond to this mercy of God. The right way to respond to this mercy of God is to bring about a change in my life. So we cannot go back reading Romans, the book of Romans saying, okay, Paul is saying this is only by the mercy of God. It's only by the grace of God. Because with the same breath that he is talking about God's grace and mercy, he's now giving us instructions. He's now requesting us to respond to that grace, to respond to that mercy by by, uh, having a rational expression of worship. Verse 2, he says, I want you to go on and not copy the behaviors and the customs of this world. Do not copy the behaviors and the customs of this world. Because when when we receive Jesus, we think that, okay, I will will have a relationship with Jesus. I'll go to church every Sunday and, and, and that's it. Most, the only thing that changes is instead of sleeping late on Sunday mornings, you come to church on Sunday mornings, but then the rest of your week is still the same. Isn't that a problem? That the rest of the week you're still behaving like how you behaved earlier. We still respond like how the people of the world respond. We still live, talk, uh, you know, make choices, get into relationships and get out of them in the same way that the world does. He says, you cannot copy the behavior and the customs of this world. In every aspect of our life, there are, there are behaviors and there are customs, right? We have traditions that have been handed down by our parents. We have customs that our, our community will force upon us. We have customs that our churches, our, our uh, you know, our spiritual communities will, will tell you, hey, you dress like this, you do this, you do that. There are, there are customs and traditions that uh, you will receive from Uh, watching television, being on the internet, you see their dressing sense and you see how they uh, do their weddings and you know, you you automatically, you begin to take inspirations from them and you're like, I'll wear the same dress on my wedding day or I'll do the exact same thing. So God is saying, do not let your lifestyle be based on what the world around you does things. The world around you, they are inspired from the wrong place. What they carry on the outside may even look beautiful, acceptable, glamorous in a nice way. That, that, I'm not just talking about the evil things or the bad things. It's easy to avoid the bad things, right? But even the good things, Paul is saying do not copy the behaviors and the customs of this world. So when you wake up in the morning, can you... Can you just evaluate all the things that you're planning to do that day and ask yourself, how much of this represents the behaviors and the customs of this world? How much of this is in tune with what everybody else is doing? What am I doing that is representing heaven on this place? It says, but instead of copying that, why don't you let God transform you into a new person? How will God transform you into a new person? By the laying on of hands. Pastor will call for a, 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 a special time. And pastor will lay hands on And then you will walk out completely new, right? And then immediately everybody who, who comes, man, I'm telling you, you, you'll have a total change. No, 
that is for those that are under a bondage that are under a, a addiction probably or or a lie that they can't see or they can't get out of for them they need that deliverance boom take them out of it things that they can't do but then the problem with many of us is not that we don't have the deliverance the problem is that we are delivered out of egypt but we are walking all in all through the wilderness thinking like slaves thinking like egyptians thinking like our behavior our our conversation our thought patterns everything is like how we were in our old life so paul says don't continue to imitate these guys instead instead change the way that you think what does it say changing the way that you think the other translations would say renew your mind renew your mind renew your mind how many of you renew your uh, sms or data validity packs what do you do monthly once you renew a pack your the pack right or yearly once you renew your insurances or once in a while whenever something expires you you renew it because you know that if i don't renew this i am not going to be able to sustain myself in this season and and paul says you need to make sure that your mind is constantly renewed that is what will keep you transformed what we think is okay i got saved i have accepted jesus in my life i think that is enough but paul says no you need to constantly renew your mind constantly receive a fresh pack of god's principles god's uh, thought patterns god's way of dealing all the behaviors and the customs of this world get replaced by the behaviors and the customs that god wants you to have he says you will be transformed into a new person when you do that you don't just become a a different version of your old self no you become a whole new person your personality begins to change your your behaviors will will take on a new new form everything in your life will begin to change completely he says then you will learn to know god's will for you which is good pleasing and perfect so in other words when i when i when my mind is not renewed and god speaks to me or god you know or we hear god's will for our lives that is not going to work for us because it's not the good pleasing and the perfect will because our our unrenewed mind will misinterpret everything that god is speaking to us everything that god is speaking to us i've i've had so many times when people have walked up to us and and they have said god told me to do this and it'll be completely opposite to what god actually was speaking on that day why because they were listening to the message with a unrenewed mind they had a preconceived notion that this is what i want to do this is how i want to live my life this is what i want to do with my relationships this is what i do want to do with my finances and every time they come they listen to a message they will go back believing the exact opposite of what i was actually wanting to teach them why because they had not renewed their mind so what is god's will god's will is good it is pleasing and it is perfect but the one barrier to receiving that will in our life is an unrenewed mind it says then you see that word it says then you will learn then you will understand once you are transformed into a new person by the changing of your mind it doesn't matter how many prophets come and prophesy to you it doesn't matter how many encounters you have it doesn't matter how many revelations you have if your mind is not renewed you will not be able to walk in the good the pleasing and the perfect will of god your mind is the big blockage the big stumbling block between the will of god and between your old life so if you can renew your mind on a daily basis if you can change the way that you think on a daily basis why do we do this every morning podcast it is so that you have something to change on a daily basis something that god is speaking to you why why do we encourage you to go back read your bible 
every day, every day, not, not once a week, not when you want to hear a word from God, but every day that you need to keep reading God's word. Why? So that your mind can be renewed. Don't read the Bible just so you can know what to do for the day. When your mind is renewed, you will automatically hear the good, pleasing, and the perfect will of God. See, God's will is available. It's there in the atmosphere. It's, it's already revealed to us. But only the ones that, that have their minds renewed can understand it clearly. Or they will hear it in parts. You know how a broken radio catches frequencies. Yeah. You, you are hearing, but you're not hearing the actual thing that this guy is saying. He may be saying there is a roadblock on this, this, this road. Uh, you will hear it as, okay, there is this, this road, you have to take this road. And you will end up taking the road that you're not supposed to take. <laughs> Why? Because there is signal drops. You're not hearing it completely. And that's how we hear God's will for our lives, because our minds are not renewed. Come on, let's read it one more time. Don't copy the behaviors and the customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way that you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is the good and the pleasing and the perfect will. Then you will learn, then you will understand. So every day we have to make this practice where we, where we say, Lord, help, change, change the way that I think, Lord. Change the way that I think. Let there be a renewal in my mind. Verse 3, it says, Because of the privilege and the authority that God has given me, I give each of you this warning. Don't think you are better than you really are. Look at your neighbor and say, Don't think you are better than you really are. I'm not saying it, Paul is saying it, so you can say it a little more authoritatively. <laughs> you, you can say it boldly because it says, because of the privilege and the authority that God has given me, Paul is using that privilege as their leader, as their pastor. And he's saying, I'm, I'm giving you a warning. What he gave previously was a request that you, you bring your bodies, your whole life, dedicate it as a worship to God. But now, next, what he is giving is a warning. He's saying, I want you to make sure that you don't think of yourself highly. You know, Paul is teaching us how to renew our mind. See, what is the world's way of teaching you? The world's way of teaching you is saying, hey, don't, don't, uh, don't accept that you're a failure. You have to believe that you are the best, you are the highest, you are the, you're the goodest in everything. But Paul says, I'll, I'll teach you biblical confidence. What is biblical confidence? He's saying, don't think of yourself highly. Don't think too much of yourself. See, even in the previous chapter, you would see how he begins to attack pride. He, he's saying, hey, if, if by any means you think that you deserve this, you don't. We don't deserve God's grace. We don't deserve God's mercy. I, I'm teaching you all this so you, your pride will decrease. That you will not come to church thinking, oh man, I deserve to be here. I deserve to be treated well. No, none of us deserve to be treated well. So he's saying, hey, hear the warning. Don't think in your head that you are better than you really are. See, in our actions, no, we, we may act very humble. But in our head, what we believe in our head, is very necessary, very important that we fit. Pride is not expressed in actions. You can mask the pride in your actions very well, but what really matters is what do you think of yourself in your head? Because Paul is saying you're thinking of yourself highly than you really are. But this is what you should be doing. You should be honest in your evaluation of yourselves. So Paul is encouraging the church to evaluate ourselves. He's not saying, okay, just don't think of yourself at all. No, you have to think of yourself. You have to evaluate yourself. But how do you evaluate yourself? Based on how much, how much Bible you read? Or how many services you went to? Or how many people laid hands on you? Or how much money you gave to God? How do you evaluate yourself? 
It says, measuring yourselves by the faith that God has given you. Do you know that when we reach heaven, there are going to be hierarchies? Not based on how, uh, how good looking you are, not based on how big your church was, not based on how much money you gave to God. The hierarchies will be based on how much faith you had. Faith you had. He's saying, measure yourself, evaluate yourself. And, you, you know, you have to be honest about this. And you, he's saying, measure how much faith you have. How much faith you have. That is the true measure. If there is one thing that you can compete with each other, is in saying, I, I want to believe God more than my brother. Because that is a good place for competition. I, I, I want to trust God harder. I, I want to believe God in the most, the darkest seasons of my life. I want to be able to worship God. When I go through the, the, the lowest points of my life, I want to be able to worship God. When I have nothing, no resources in front of me, I want to be able to stand up and with confidence, I want to express my love for God. That is an expression of how mature you are. Yeah, yeah. Don't, don't limit how, how important or how big you are based on what, what we see on the outside. What we see on the outside is the guys on the stage, they are very good people. They're very anointed people, you know. They, they are the ones whose pictures will be there, whose videos will be there, who has, the, who has the permission to lay hands on people. No, 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 that's, that's not how you measure yourself. You measure yourself based on your faith. How much faith do you have? How much faith has God given you? You know, even in saying how much faith you have, Paul is making sure that you remain humble by saying it's not a faith that you have, it's a faith that God has given you. It's not a faith that you can have in yourself. It's a faith that God has given you. But have you responded? You know, every time that you experience a challenging situation, it is an opportunity that God has given you to identify how much faith you have. For example, when Goliath came to kill Saul, it was an opportunity for David to understand how anointed he is. Do you understand what I'm saying? It was, it, it was not after he killed Goliath that he received an anointing. He already had the anointing, but that anointing for him to understand the measure of their anointing, to understand how powerful is this anointing, he had to take hold of this opportunity and say, okay, wait, wait, let me, let me try this out. Let me try out. And that's when he realized, man, I can do this. Till then, he was just a shepherd boy. But after that, he joined Saul's army and then he would kill all the giants for King Saul. He would kill so many people for King Saul. Why? Now he understood this is my capacity. He had a revelation of how much my faith can do for me. What we do is we look at, we look at the giants and say, if I was anointed, why will this happen to me? If, I, if God had really given me faith, if God had really showed his grace, his mercy, to, why is this happening to me? No, it's an opportunity for you to exercise your faith and have a revelation of who you are, of who you are. And if you see there are areas that are lacking, if you see, if you see that you're still freaking out about the same things you freaked out 10 years back, then you've not grown in your faith. If you're still if you're still worried about the same things that you, you were worried about 10 years back, you've not grown in faith. I'm not saying that we will not have battles and challenges. We will have battles. Those battles need to keep increasing in stature. If, uh, if 10 years back you were worried about your health, even now you're still worried about your health, no, you've not grown in stature. By now you need to have trusted God blindly after walking with God for 10 years, seeing the hand of God. There was a season of my life where I was worried about finances, where I would freak out when finances didn't come in time. And I would question God. I still remember I, I, there was this one night when I wept. I, I missed the last bus. Back in the day, I was traveling by bus to, uh, from one place to the other uh, to, to do ministry. So I had gone to Kormagla. I used to live in Yashwantpur back in the day. 
So I'd gone to Kormangla to speak to somebody, minister to somebody, and that meeting went very late. And then I had to take a return bus uh, to, I think, Majestic. And from Majestic, I, lo- I missed the last bus home. So I had to walk back all the way. And all the way, I, I, I cried. I, I cribbed, saying, God, this is not cool. I'm your servant. Why are you letting this happen to me? I, you know, I, I actually was very sad that I didn't have enough money to take a rickshaw. There were rickshaws, but I didn't have enough money. I just had exactly the money required to, to take the bus back home. And I was very sad. And, and I was upset with God. But can you imagine, 10 years later, if I'm still doing the same, then there is no growth in my spirit. There was a season when lack of finances used to bother me. Now it doesn't. Now it shouldn't. That is a sign that what used to bother There are things that bother me even today, but not those things. Those things cannot hurt me anymore. I have grown. I have I've seen the provisions of God over and above and beyond that to, to, to ever, ever question God again in that one area. So the Lord is saying, you have to be honest with yourself and measure yourself by the level of faith you have. Because there is only one thing that you can please God with. There is only one thing that you can catch God's attention with and it is your faith. You cannot impress God by anything else. You can only and only impress God with your faith. And so measure your faith. Measure the level of your faith. Measure how you respond to circumstances and situations in your life. He's saying, make sure that you are honest in your evaluation of yourself. Measuring yourselves by the faith that God has given you. Verse 4, he explains this in the context of the church. Saying, just as our bodies have many parts, in each part, it has a special function. So, not every part of the body requires equal blood flow. You understand what I'm saying? Paul is saying it in the context of saying, Measure who you are, how much you have, based on how much faith has been given to you. And then he goes on to explain why this faith has been given to you. He's saying this faith is necessary, not so you can just have a fun time, you can overcome all your battles and, and you know, make sure no Goliath comes to attack you or your house. No, now there is a role. David, you have an assignment in the nation of Israel. This, according to the measure of your faith, you will realize who you are in Israel. The nation will recognize who you are according to the measure of your faith. Okay? Now he's saying, just as our bodies has many parts, but each part has a special function. So the, the brain and the hands don't need equal amount of blood. Yeah? Your, blo- your hands and your hair, your hair doesn't need blood. There are some parts of your body that doesn't need blood flow. There are some parts of your body that needs a lot of blood flow, that, that needs more energy, that consumes more energy. So, so there are certain functions that, that, that will not happen if, you're, if there is problem in your blood flow. But your hair will still grow. Your, your, you, you will still look the same on the outside. But there are internal organs that are not doing well because the blood is not flowing correctly in all those parts. So God is saying, just as our bodies have many parts, but each part has a special function. You and I, we need to understand how much, how much blood flow has been given to me. And based on that, what is my role in the body? What am I supposed to be doing? How important am I? How much can I contribute in the body based on how much faith has been given to me? Why is God asking you to evaluate yourself? Not so you can brag about or boast about or be proud about who you are. He is in fact warning, beginning with a warning that says don't think of yourself highly. But instead, be honest about your evaluation of yourself because just as our bodies have many parts, Each part has a special function. Verse 5, so it is with Christ's body. We are many parts of one body and we all belong to each other. 
So it's, it's, it's saying that we are part of Christ's body. And of course, because we are part of Christ's body, we belong to Christ. Yeah, we are connected to Christ. But as much as we are connected to Christ, we are also connected to one another. We are connected to one another. Like if, if, if this hand has a mosquito sitting on it, the, the hand is not going to only receive help from the head. The hand is saying, no, 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 I don't want the rest of the body. I want the head only to come and rescue me. But what will the head do? The head will direct this hand to go and kill this mosquito. But this hand is saying, no, 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 I cannot get along with that hand. I, I'm, I'm not, I, you know, I just know, like, I just, we just don't get along. Our personalities, no. This is two different personalities, you know. Just so hard to get along. This is, I don't think God has called me to, you know, be in friendship. I, I know who my head is. I know the body, but I, but there is a mosquito that is sucking out your blood. And the solution is with the other hand. We are dependent on each other. Church, we are not just dependent on the head. The head will use the body to help each other. And the more we resist the help of the others in the body. The other, other day I was talking to somebody and I was telling her, Hey, you know what? God wants us to carry each other's burdens. God wants us to make sure. Why will God expect us to carry each other's burdens? It's only because God wants us to be dependent on each other. God wants us to be one body, one, one uh, church, one family. If all that we needed was prayer and going to God, then we don't have to be connected to each other. But the Bible says, no, that's not how it works in God's body. It says, many, we are parts of one body and we all belong to each other. The other translations would use the word, we are dependent on each other. We receive help from each other, not just from the head, but even each other. Verse 6, in His grace, God has given us different gifts for, for doing certain things well. You remember how it said how one body has different parts? And, and the Bible says, in His grace, all the parts of Christ's body, we've been given different gifts and we are given these different gifts so that we can do these things well. Okay, the, if I cannot expect my hand to do the job of the heart and the job of the kidney and the job of the lungs and the job of my intestine. No, 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 I, I'm not going to expect my hand to do everything. Each of us, we have been given a different task and all that you need to do is do your job well, very well. And he says, so if God has given you the ability to prophesy Speak out with as much faith as God has given you. So, why has God given you the ability to prophesy? Just to feel good about yourself, right? Just to know how anointed you are, how much faith. No, no. It is so that you can help the others in the body. And you speak out with as much faith as God has given you. Use every opportunity that you get, every Time a Goliath comes in front of you, you use your prophetic gift. Don't, don't just wait for the, for the intercessor to pray and take it down. No, no, no. You, you use your prophetic gift to understand where we need to hit this Goliath to bring it down. So he says, those that have been given the gift of prophecy, not everybody maybe, everybody can prophesy, but not everybody has the gift to prophesy. Okay? It says, those that are given the gift of prophecy, you have to prophesy with as much faith as God has given you. I, I don't know how many of you remember last Sunday, I taught you something. The calling of God and the gifts of God are not revocable. They cannot be withdrawn. God is not going to take them away. But something else happens when we don't use it for a really long time. It just becomes redundant. It just becomes useless. Like if David would not kill Goliath, even though the anointing is upon him, after a while, he will become another Saul who is a namesake king and yet doesn't have the ability, physical ability to kill the Goliaths. But was he anointed to kill Goliaths? Let me ask you this. Was, was Saul anointed to kill Goliath? Yes, he was. But because he had not used the gift for a long time, 
Now he did not have the faith or the confidence to use that gift. But the Lord is calling so many of the prophets in this house to now begin to open up your mouth and prophesy. You may ask me, Pastor, we, we are talking about the gospel. We are talking about salvation. Why is this important? See, you should understand your gospel, it is incomplete if you do not respond to that gospel. Paul is saying this is how you respond. You give yourself completely. You give your bodies as a holy, living, sacrifice, a ra rational, a logical, and intelligent way to worship Him. And this is what you should do. Prophesy with everything that God has given you. With as much faith. And, and Paul is listing out all these things that you can do as an expression of your worship. He's not, he's not just saying, okay, uh, you know, make sure that you do this sacrifice thing. And he's not asking you to interpret what that sacrifice is. He is interpreting that sacrifice. He's telling you how to not copy the patterns and the behaviors of the world, how to not live like how companies and organizations do, but instead how to function as a body, how to function as the body of Jesus. How does the body of Jesus function? We are dependent on each other. There are certain parts that have more and certain parts which have less. We acknowledge that, we understand, we, we, we evaluate ourselves honestly according to the faith that has been given to us and we make sure that we give 100% so that the body of Christ can increase and the body of Christ can grow. Why do we do this? Because this is the rational expression, the rational way of worshipping Him. Please understand. The Lord is not just interested in your songs. He's interested in what comes after the song. He's interested in the prophecies that you declare, how you exercise your faith. Verse 7, if your gift is serving others, then serve them well. Which means there is a possibility that you have the gift of serving and you don't serve well. You just do a mediocre job, like a 50, because it's, it's in your gift, it's your, you know, it just comes so naturally to you, to, to give, to serve, to help, so you just serve, and after a while, you serve, 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 it's just so part of your, this thing that now only a 50% effort is required for you to serve, but Paul is saying, no, 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 that will not work, you have to serve in a way that it is a sacrifice it is an acceptable sacrifice you give your hundred percent your whole body you lay yourself completely down so that you serve with excellence serve well not just not just saying okay oh, because I'm here I'll just do whatever no no no. that will not do here when you prophesy you prophesy with all the faith that God has given you when you serve you serve well you serve with excellence and if you're a teacher if you've been given the gift of teaching in the church, outside, the church, wherever, if you've been given the gift of impacting, influencing others, then do that well. Be intentional. Grow. Don't be stuck with one place. Keep on teaching. Keep on teaching. Keep on teaching and make sure you become excellent as a teacher. This is how you worship God. Verse 8. If your gift is to encourage others, then be encouraging. If you're, you will find something or the other this morning. Trust me, if you can't prophesy, you will be able to serve. If you can't serve, you, you will be able to teach. If you can't teach, you will be at least able to encourage others. I, I believe this is something that all of us need. If, if, if all that you do is discourage others, then please. It, it may be a... We may need a healing and deliverance section just, just for you. No. You and I, we are called to encourage others. And Paul is saying, this is, there is a special gift of encouragement. Some people, they just have the gift of encouragement. That you just go spend time with them, you just come out encouraged. You don't have to do anything. They don't have to give you a Bible study. They don't have to lay hands on you and prophesy, nothing. Just by spending time with them, just the words that come out of their mouth, they are just naturally encouraging. You don't go back discouraged thinking, oh my God, look at how much faith he has and how miserable I am. They, you, you, you go back encouraged. And the Bible says, those who have the gift of encouraging others, be encouraging and do it well. 
If your gift is giving, then give generously. All of us, we will give. But some people, they have the gift of giving. Aren't we blessed to have people like that in our church? Who have the gift of giving. And the Bible says those who have the gift of giving, they have to give generously. They have to keep looking for opportunities where they can give and they constantly keep giving and giving generously. If God has given you leadership ability, then what should you do? Take that responsibility what? Seriously, be serious about it. Be intentional about it. Work hard. See, it, yes, it is. Yes, it is by faith, by grace, by mercy that we are here. But now that we are here, God wants us to respond to this gospel in a certain elegance, in a certain standard. And God's saying, you need to be serious about how you're going to serve the church, how you're going to serve the body. God is not talking about how you'll go feed the poor and the hungry and the lame people outside the church. No, your first service begins in the church. How are you going to prophesy in the church? How are you going to serve the other parts of the body? How are you going to give? How are you going to uh, encourage? How are you going to teach? So he's saying, take your leadership ability seriously. Take your responsibility seriously. And if you have a gift of showing kindness to others, hospitality to others, then do it gladly. See, I'll, I'll tell you this. Sometimes when somebody sees that you have a gift of showing hospitality and kindness, all of a sudden, all the needy people will be attracted to you. And sometimes, you know, you, you, you can get to a place where you're like, ah, just to get this guy to stop calling me. You know, let me just do something. But he's saying no. He's saying, whatever you do, do it gladly. Give it from your heart. Even if it is little that you can do, do it with... With, with joy, with happiness, with everything in your heart. Just do it gladly. Verse 9. Don't just pretend to love others. Look at your neighbor and tell them this. Don't just pretend. I'm going to make you very uncomfortable this morning. Don't just pretend to be sitting happy next to me. <laughs> this is from the Bible, yeah? Come on, I can preach this to you. If it was from you, you, you if, if it is something that I cooked up because I feel that you need, <laughs> that's different. This is from the Bible. We planned reading this long time back. Yeah? Paul is saying, don't just pretend to love others. Because so many of us, we know that oh, I'm supposed to love. I'm supposed to forgive. So, so, so just, I'll just pretend that I don't have a problem with this person, you know? I'll just pretend like everything... Paul is saying, no, just don't pretend. If you, don't, if you feel like you don't have love, go and ask the Holy Spirit for it. Don't love in your emotional strength. Your emotions will dry out very soon. But when the Holy Spirit comes, when He fills your heart with love, you'll be able to love the most terrible people. You should hear the testimony of Corrie ten Boom. Have you heard of her? She was one of the survivors of the, of the Holocaust uh, from the Nazi Germany and then after she came out of that place she was sharing her testimony in one place and then a man came to her and the man said I was there in that place and then she looked at him and she recognized him she remembered that this was the man who raped my sister this was the man who hurt my family she everything in her was like you know, she had just preached a sermon on forgiveness. She had just preached about God's love. And here she is faced with the reality of seeing this person face to face. And, you know, I can't put it in the same words that she said. But she said, but I did extend my hands to him. Without any, any feeling in my heart, I still did it. But immediately I felt the love of God fill my heart and flow through my hands and, and flow into his life and give me the ability to forgive him. I hugged him. He received Jesus. He, uh, you know, can you imagine that? That's possible only and only with the love of Jesus. Here if somebody takes our parking spot, we have a problem with them, you know. We, we, we can't even pretend to love them. Forget about loving them really. Paul says, don't just pretend to love others. 
but love them really love them from your heart you need to hate what is wrong if there is something wrong you need to hate that hate that sin but continue to love the sinner you if you have if you feel that somebody is doing something that is unbiblical that is wrong there are so many people uh, who have come to me and said pastor i'm planning to do this and i've had to tell them son or daughter i don't believe in what you're doing so i'm not going to support this but i'm still going to love you if you fail i'll help you whatever you need i'll still be there for you but i don't condone this thing i'm not saying i'm i'm not saying what you're doing is right but i am going to still love you and we need to have that grace to show to one another where we will hate what is wrong when you see that something is wrong something is unbe- something is not godly you need to learn to hate those things you can be radical in your hate towards that thing but you need to hold tightly to what is good to what is right to what is precious verse 10 love each other with what with genuine affection and take delight in honoring each other come on now can we all read it one more time i i just i just i wish this was the last verse for today but i i have to i have to drill drill this into your spirit read one more time love each other with genuine affection and take delight in honoring each other you know we are only taught to honor the ones that are above us and it comes easy that that's easy trust me honoring somebody above you is easy but honoring somebody that is sitting beside you know that is where the the thing is tough where you somehow feel that i have the upper hand that i've been in church longer than her you know i i have spoken in more languages you know tongues also you you classify you i have spoken in three unknown tongues how many unknown tongues we 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 know how to show ourselves more experience better than somebody else but the bible says take delight in honoring each other and love each other with genuine affection do you want to know how to give yourself as a holy and an acceptable and a living sacrifice this is how you do it because doing this is going to kill you it's not easy it's you cannot love each other with genuine affection without having to you know kill a side of you because every day you'll have to uh, i don't like this but uh, you know bury that so that i can take delight in honoring this person i can take delight in serving this person the next verse i don't know who this verse is for but uh, let's read it still <laughs> All the lazy people in the house said a loud amen. amen. <laughs> Lord, thank you for the person that said an amen and thank you for all the other liars. <laughs> This is how you know how many people lie in the presence of God, yeah? Says never be lazy but work hard. and serve the lord enthusiastically man this is where i admire apostle paul because he had the best of both he was the man who said we are not saved by works we are saved by grace and yet he would say i work harder than all the other 12 apostles put together and now he's teaching the church and saying hey you when you serve and you you don't serve the lord enthusiastically when you don't work hard you know you you you're working but your work is not hard enough when you're serving but there is no enthusiasm in your serving how many of us know that you can serve without enthusiasm you know what paul calls you you are a lazy bone that's what paul says just don't be lazy but when you work make sure that you work hard that you serve enthusiastically you ready for the last few verses verse 14 bless those who persecute you don't curse them pray that god will bless them all of you who have a habit of cursing people that hurt you that you know that do things that you don't like that do things that you don't fall in line with paul says bless them don't curse them 
you know pray for them pray that god will bless them you know this is anti culture this is why paul was saying don't copy the behaviors and the pattern customs of the world in the custom of the world you call down fire on that guy you call down fire on his family you know and sometimes we use scriptures to do that some what is that some some 105 or 106 he literally prays for heart attack for his enemies you know and we use scripture to justify how we are feeling and what we want to do but paul says no that's that's the pattern of this world we are renewed people we have been transformed into a new person now we we have a rational way of worshiping god because of the mercies of god now we have to respond like this we don't persecute or hurt or curse the ones that persecute us instead when somebody persecutes us we bless them we pray that god will bless them be happy with those who are happy and weep with those who are those who are weeping find people that are happy and go and be happy with them don't be jealous of them don't don't find reasons to avoid celebrations when you see that somebody got a new car go celebrate with them thank god for that car thank god you know be happy about it when you see that somebody is struggling somebody is weeping somebody is going through a, a sorrowful time don't avoid that person just go be sad with that person don't try to cheer them up all the time you can just be sad with them weep with those who weep and be happy rejoice with those who rejoice verse 16 live in harmony with each other don't be too proud to enjoy the company of ordinary people and don't think that you know it all <laughs> i believe god is speaking to me i don't know how many of you feel this <laughs> the lord is saying enjoy the company of ordinary you know some of us we only want anointed people people that you know talk like us feel like us work no 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 paul is saying even ordinary people find joy in serving ordinary people enjoy their company don't think that you know it all don't think that you are above everybody else and when you do that you are in fact living in harmony with each other verse 17 never pay back evil with more evil because that's the customs and the patterns of the world do things in such a way that everyone can see that you are honorable when you express your love and your honor people can see it it's not something they can ignore they will be able to witness it and and say wait 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 i know how how bad this person was to you but i have seen how you've responded back honorably verse 18 do all that you can to live in peace with everyone everyone don't pick a fight everywhere you go let people know that you're a honorable person let people know that you are willing to live at peace it says do all that you can now there are some things that you can't you can't change somebody's mind about you you can't go and get into somebody's head and convince them that you're not against them but do all that you can have you done everything that you can to live in peace with so and so person that's it then you're clear before god then you are expressing your worship to god in a holy and a sacrificial way but if you, if there is anything else that god will ask you to do make sure that you do it today not tomorrow not next week but today before you finish before the sun sets down today make sure that you do all that you can to be at peace with everyone dear friends never take revenge because leave that to the righteous anger of god don't 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 take that in you into your hands he's saying don't take revenge there is a righteous anger of god for the scriptures say i will take revenge i will pay them back says the lord instead verse 20 if your enemies are hungry you feed them if they are thirsty then give them something to drink because in doing this you will in fact be heaping burning coals of shame on their heads yeah paul is teaching us a countercultural method of dealing with problematic people he's saying when when your enemies are hungry what do you do not not take a ak47 and shoot them down you go and feed them you go and take care of their thirst because god is the one who will fight for you 
There are two things that the Bible says belongs to God. One is your tithes and another is vengeance. Your tithes belongs to God and vengeance belongs to God. These two things you shouldn't touch. Because if you touch the tithes, you become a robber. And if you take the justice into your own hands, then you are saying, I am, I'm, you're taking God's place. You're saying, I'm the one, I'm the judge. You're not the judge. Leave the justice into the righteous anger of God. When God begins to fight for you, you there, is a, there is a limit to which you can prove yourself right and acceptable and all of that. But beyond that, you have to leave it to the righteous anger of God. And God will fight for you. The last verse for the day, verse 21. Don't let evil conquer you, but conquer evil by doing good. This is how you respond to the mercies of God. This is how you stop yourself from uh, copying the behaviors and the patterns of the world. This is how you make sure that your life is transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you become a whole new person. This is how God can change you into, into a person that is going to be beneficial for the church, that is going to be a blessing for the house of God, that is going to be a blessing for other people. That we, we serve the head, Jesus, but at the same time, we serve each other. We love each other with genuine affection and we take delight in honoring each other. Amen? This morning, we have to say, Lord, I am yielding myself to who you are. I'm, 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 I'm saying yes to functioning with the highest level of faith that has been given to me. I want to be useful in the church. I don't want to be a redundant part of this church or the church of Jesus or the universal church of Jesus. I want to be a useful member of the church because that is the acceptable way of my worship. That is a rational way of worship. Thank you for tuning in for today's sermon. We hope this word has been a blessing to you. Do visit us at dreamingrevival.com for more information. You are welcome to tune in every Sunday for our live celebration service at 11 a.m. at youtube.com slash Pastor God bless you and have a blessed week.